think I can pause it once it gets going. Hello, 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 hello. We hear you, <laughs> Jack. You hear me? That's wonderful. <laughs> and we see the slides. Hello, Deepak. Long time, no see. <laughs> Hi, Paris. In fact, I wanted oh. to ask you. Yes, like, how are you, do uh, how are you doing? <laughs> I'm good. I'm good. Good to see you. I mean, good to see yes, you. Yes, nice. Nice Friendly to see you. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> I'm probably going to ask you at some point how can someone be interested or join this, but but I, I leave it up. Oh, yes, but you, you just tell me, uh, I will add you to the mailing list and you will receive all the information. Uh, Bruce is in the list as well as some people from WITS. Um, but uh, just uh, after the meeting, send me your email and then I will put you in the user's uh, poll list. So we'll get all this information about the project and things like Thank that. Thank you very much. Yes. Very good. Thank you. Uh, should I start at some stage? As you wish, Robbie. We're waiting for you. <laughs> <laughs> Who, who's the Who's the chair? Someone should be chair. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, I, I'm going to introduce myself and start. Okay, let's go. <laughs> Maybe you, uh, Robbie, you, you tell us who are people in the in the room because we we see people in on on video, but we don't see people on the in the room. Okay, uh, ladies and gentlemen, I've been told I should start. I'm just trying to figure out where I am. I think I've got to. The sound goes in there, and the camera goes in there. So hopefully, people on 
on uh, Zoom won't be talking at the, uh, looking at the back of my head. Okay, just to explain, I'm Robbie Lindsay. I'm from the University of the Western Cape. I'm uh, from the physics department there, though I have uh, two or three other jobs as well, but that's the main reason why I'm here today. Uh, and this is a rather weird thing. You know, I certainly didn't expect to come and talk at the geophysics department at WITS. It's uh, sort of good to be at WITS. I also see at least one physicist that I know. Um, the reason that I got to be here, two, uh, two physicists, the reason that I, we ended up here is a few of us have had this, what we used to think was a mad idea, but now it's sort of become mainstream. The idea is that we want to build an underground physics laboratory in South Africa. And as especially the physicists know, uh, these laboratories are very uh, popular these days because of dark matter searches and so on. So I'm going to explain briefly why we need that, say a bit of the history of underground uh, physics experiments in South Africa, which is actually started a long time ago, but um, there's not much has happened since then. Um, we uh, are at the stage now where we want to develop this lab in the Huguenot Tunnel outside Paul, and uh, we need some geophysicists, which is the main reason why I'm here. And thanks to Lumkile, who's also going to be talking, we made contact with the WITS Geophysics Department, we're interested in geophysicists and mining engineers, people that know about uh, doing things underground. So, okay, just to explain the talk this afternoon, I'm going to just give an overview of what's happening. Uh, then uh, for 15 minutes, something like that. Then Lumkile will talk a little bit about the muon measurements specifically and some of the uh, background of what we need to do to figure out whether this is worthwhile doing. You know, is it worth uh, having a lab in that tunnel or should we go to a deep mine or what should we do? And then lastly, and probably most importantly, we're going to have somebody on Zoom. So the two of us are here, but we're then going to have Jacques Marteau from France on Zoom. He's an expert on measuring muons, on muography. And so he will explain the muon measurements that we're doing in the tunnel, why we're doing it, what we want to do, and especially try and encourage some of the geophysicists to get involved in the work there, because he's simply measuring the muons. But to really know how effective the overburden is, he's interested in things like gravity measurements and, and stuff like that. But I will leave that to him. Okay, so I'm just going to give you a quick uh, overview of what's uh, happening or what we're doing. If I can, if I can go to the next slide, which I can't. Ah, there we go. There, there we go. Okay, I've already told you there's, there are going to be three speakers and what we're going to be talking about. You'll hear that soon enough. Okay, for those who don't know, and I know some people here are experts on that, um, uh, Witz actually was involved in an underground physics experiment which, with one of the Nobel Prize winners for uh, finding the neutrino. This is something, uh, um, Friedel Schellschop, which some of you may remember. He was one of the big guys here at Witz for a long time. Uh, he, when he was still very young, got involved in this experiment where people were trying to measure the neutrino. Neutrinos are really a very popular thing in physics, especially now again. But in those days, in the 60s, they were only, uh, only just been discovered and it was really difficult to measure them in any sort of way. The background kills one. You get very, very few counts. It has a very, very small interaction with anything else. And you had to go to places then where you didn't have background. And the ERPM mine uh, in, here in Witwatersrand was uh, a good place to go. And Cell Shop convinced um, Frederick Reins, who eventually won the Nobel Prize for discovering the neutron and the neutrino, to do experiments here. And here's just a copy of their paper and uh, something where it was uh, 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 published in Fizzerev-Lett. And here's a plaque, which is at the ERPM mine. I stole this um, slide from... Uh, uh, Ilias, who's in the audience here, there's a plaque at the ERPM mine saying this is where they found the uh, first natural high energy neutrino was observed. Okay, so the, uh, jump ahead uh, 30, 40 years or whatever. Uh, Sean Weinkart, who's at Stanford. Luke, can you meet your phone, I'm told? <laughs> I don't know who Luke is, but he seems to have solved it. Okay, move on uh, 30 or 40 years. Uh, Can you close your mic, Lou Ashwaltz? Okay, so then Sean Weinhardt, who's at Stellenbosch, head of the Department of the Physics at Stellenbosch, he had this idea that maybe... maybe, 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 maybe. 
No, we, we have an echo. Oh, yeah. Okay, now he has closed his mic. It's fine. Look, okay, go on. Okay, go, he solved go. it. It's solved. I'm told. <laughs> that was just for who's commenting. Okay, we've solved the echo problem for those who are worried. Uh, Sean Weinhardt, he was uh, looking at the at the um, tunnel outside Paul, between Paul and Worcester. I know you've all driven through that tunnel probably, or most people have, but you never look. And if you look, you will see that there's actually a whole separate tunnel, the, what they call the North Bore. And so one could actually do some experiments in there. And we went and actually measured a few things, like what's the radon, what's the background, and we're sort of vaguely thinking about a, 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 an underground lab. Uh, Sean then gave a talk on this somewhere uh, in Europe, and it got published in Physics Procedure, and that sort of got some people thinking about it again. Um, and then there was a, uh, another talk which actually led to people being aware of it and led to the more recent talks about it. Uh, this was the case for an underground neutrino facility in South Africa, and you may recognize the um, speaker there as uh, somebody who is well-known at WITS, I think. <laughs> I was worried, well, no, I was hoping he might pop into the talk, but uh, I, 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 I thought that was extremely unlikely. <laughs> Anyhow, so Zeblon um, uh, pushed this idea as well, and he's still very keen on it. So anybody at WITS, if you want to get into good, the good books of the big boss, <laughs> you should be linking up with uh, this. Okay, this um, was, uh, so some people thought, talked about it, but to give you an idea, it wasn't really a, 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 a very much... Um, a uh, serious discussion, for example, you see uh, there's somebody, M. van Rooyen. I don't know if anybody knows M. van Rooyen. I very much doubt it because actually the name is wrong. <laughs> His surname is spelled wrongly. So that was, um, you know, it, it, it uh, wasn't um, that, that serious an operation. But okay, underground labs, as I mentioned, is big business these days. Um, and I'll, ex I'll tell you about Snow Lab, which I visited. There's at least 14 active underground labs in the world. And if you look at the world, you see there's only three in the Southern Hemisphere. And for the dark matter searches, there's some reason for measuring in the North and in the Southern Hemisphere at the same time. You see three in the Southern Hemisphere. Supple in Australia is still being built. So if we're quick, we can actually beat them. And this one is not being built yet. That's the one I'm talking about. And the one in, Ande in uh, uh, South America is called Andes. It looks um, very good there with two flags and a big name and whatever. That is um, behind us. They... <laughs> They, they've got fantastic plans for the laboratory there. It's going to be in the, a road tunnel, which is being built between Argentina and Chile, except it's not being built. It hasn't been given the go-ahead yet. And Argentina is bankrupt, so it's unlikely to happen soon. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Anyhow, so this is what the North Bore looks like. There's some, uh, the road hasn't been built. It's all rough and ready and what, whatever. And of course, you know, there's not much what one can do there. But when we started talking about this, um, the first person who is on the call, actually, Farouz Malek, uh, she's a, a French physicist who works at Atlas, but she was born in Algeria and grew up in Algeria. And she has always had this dream that maybe we want to have an underground lab in Africa. Now, that was just a dream, but dreams are good because sometimes dreams become reality. Anyhow, um, then recently, we, we then said we want to do some more experiments in the tunnel there, and they said to us, no, you can't do it because the Huguenot Tunnel is being upgraded. Uh, that, that north bore, which I just showed you, is going to become the road. If you travel north, you're going to be traveling in that road, and the, one, the present one will only have traffic in one direction. The number of cars on those roads are, uh, uh, in the tunnel is now big enough that they need to open the north bore. So that's a, a real problem. Uh, but on the other hand, Sandral said it estimated this, this is a 2.5 billion rand project. So a few of us, like me, was stupid enough to think, well, maybe that's an opportunity. That's a problem if they're going to build the road, but it's also an opportunity. A lot of money is going to be spent. Can't we build a lab off that North Bore the way it has been done at several labs in the world? Modan is the famous one in France, the Gran Sasso in Italy, and so on. So we formed this, we've now got a steering committee that looked at this. We had a workshop in January where we invited a number of people like the ex-head of Modan, the head of um, Snow Lab in Canada and so on. And these people all came and they were quite supportive. The underground lab uh, people, as far as I can see, there's competition, but on the other hand, there's a lot of collaboration as well because they have the same problems, how to do things underground and so on. Anyhow, so this thing has suddenly now got some uh, legs. Just to give you a bit of the UWC background, I actually, four years ago, five years ago, got involved with my colleague, Smarajit Trihambak, 
he was a he's a research chair at uh, UWC. He's now the research chair has come to an end, but he's still a nuclear physicist there. He was working on nuclei like xenon, which is used in these underground experiments to look for neutrinoless double beta decay. decay. And through that, he got involved in Nexa, which is one of these big um, collaborations to look for neutrinos. We joined in 2020. And as you can see, it's mainly the US and Canada. However, UWC is now on that list as well. Now, he then asked me to join because it turns out that I've been working on radon in South Africa. Radon in the mines is a big health issue and so on. And radon measurements is really important for this stuff as well. So suddenly, when I was about at retirement age, I got involved in a whole new project looking at Nexo. And now I'm involved in another one looking at this tunnel idea. So Nexo, of course, is one of these huge, big uh, things. It's, it's 13 meters by 13 meters, if you look uh, at that, if you look at the scale of the man on the side there. And we have a few people now who's involved in it. There's um, Smarajit and a few students and myself. Uh, we then visited the U.S. as well and spoke to, went to Stanford where there was a big collaboration meeting. And then I went to Snow Lab as well. There we are in the cavity in Snow Lab, which is a nickel mine. It's uh, about two kilometers deep. It's quite, uh, quite deep. And that's probably the best known underground lab in the world. That's where neutrino oscillations were discovered and so on. Okay, just to remind you, uh, especially if you're not working in this field. So uh, I've just used the model of the... Um, uh, Nexo uh, uh, set up there. The backgrounds which we have to worry about are muons, these things coming from the top. And most of the discussion today are going to be about those uh, muons. We've got to get rid of them. You also have in the walls, that's the other worry, you have the natural decay series, uranium-238, thorium, and potassium. That gives you gammas. The good thing about those gammas is they only go up to about uh, 3 MeV, so you can actually shield against them. You can have water shielding or whatever. That's why in this uh, setup here, the actual detector for the neutrinos double beta decay is this thing over there, but there's a whole bunch of stuff around it which gets rid of the, um, the gammas in the surrounding area. The problem with the muons are is their energy is much bigger. In Snow Lab, they also put um, uh, stuff on the wall to try and reduce the radon escape and so on. Okay, then the biggest problem, and that's the one I'm working on, which I just mentioned here, is that inside this material, you have things like copper, and copper gives off radon as well. So you have things within your uh, setup which causes background as well. Okay, but back to the tunnel. So there's the tunnel, which most of you have driven through. And if you look on the left-hand side there, there is this North Pole. It's totally undeveloped, as you could see. They're going to have to build a road. They're going to have to concrete the inside and all sorts of stuff like that. It's going to be a four or five year project. Um, and what we are now trying to do is to try and build something like what I've got on the left here. I uh, have, a, have a sort of um, a slipway where one can stop there and go in. It's probably not going to look like that because Sunrail doesn't like slipways because then if people are driving 100 kilometers an hour and some trucks are pulling off, then it's not ideal. Here's an example of one of these labs. Um, uh, this is the one between France and, 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 and Spain. Okay, so we've started, we've done some things. We've measured some radon. Uh, well, sorry, let me just first show you the, the mountain outline. So this is what the mountain looks like. This is the pole side. That's where you drive in. And that's the exit on the uh, Worcester side on that side. And as you, if you look at this uh, map of the mountain, the middle would be somewhere there, but um, it looks as if the biggest overburden is there. This uh, mountain is high, but it's not quite as good as what one would have liked. We would be better off in a deep mine, for example, but mines have other issues. Uh, so we want to certainly choose the point which is best, and that's why we're going to measure the muons. The muons, as I said, has these really high energies, and so you can't really shield them very easily. That's why we have underground mines. Okay. Um, uh, this is just to show you that we have done something. This is the radon we measured in there. It's about 50 becquerels per cubic meter. That's not particularly high. I mean, in this room, the value is probably 30 or something like that. Uh, we measured the wind speed and a few other things. I've now also measured, for the physicists who are here, we did some gamma measurements. For those who know, if you go and measure in the environment, this is the sort of background radiation that you see with the sodium iodide detector. And above 3 MeV, you do see some things but those are mainly um, uh, due to the muons. So uh, those ones over there. So what I did, take my sodium iodide detector in there. There's JJ Fansel from Stellenbosch who was involved in the measurements. 
I first counted at my house, so I turned down the amplification so that I now have from 10 to 40 MeV. If you do that and you measure in the tunnel, you get nothing in this region because there are so few muons. These gammas are formed by muons getting through all that material all through the mountain and then forming uh, uh, and then causing other rays to take place. This is a log scale, of course, so even at my home, these are very, very few counts in a sense. Uh, this is per hour, uh, but in the tunnel, I got nothing. Of course, there are some, just, just didn't count long enough to get reasonable enough statistics. Okay, um, so I uh, here I've got some numbers, but that's, uh, I won't go into the detail of that. Um, Jack's gonna be talking much more about that. Okay, uh, so what's the status? This is, at the moment, it's run by a steering committee, committee which has got Stellenbosch, Sean Weinhardt, um, um, and uh, uh, Richard Newman. Richard Newman has taken sabbatical this year and is working, as a, uh, uh, working on this project as the project manager. So he's running most things. He's uh, busy this week. Otherwise, he probably should have come up with this as well. Uh, so we had this idea. We spoke to various people. And uh, eventually, I spoke to Rob Adam. I thought he might have uh, contacts at Sunral and knows how these things work. As you know, he used to be the DG of the DSI, and now he's working at Sarau, at the astronomy people. Uh, he then, uh, with him and uh, Richard Newman and whatever, we got to talk to um, uh, Takalani Nemarui at um, DSI. He's involved in the Astro uh, group. Uh, and so he is very aware of the whole uh, justification for the SKA. The story was we build this big scientific development in Africa. People will come for, from other countries to do the experiments, and, and a lot of the funding will come from there. But it will have huge spin-offs for South Africa. And at UWC, it has been really useful. We've got lots of astro people now with postdocs and so on. So we talked to him, and eventually we spoke to Philom Dwacha, who's now retired as the D, uh, DG of DSI, and we convinced him that this was something worth doing. So they gave us 5 million rand seed funding. Uh, that might sound a lot to, to, to people who are used to the money we get from the NRF, but uh, don't, don't, hold your <laughs> don't hold out uh, uh, too much hope, because uh, about 4 million of this is going to go di directly to the engineering company who's doing the design. There's an engineering company, SMEC, that is working with Sunral to, to look at uh, what if all the stuff that needs to be done. They are then going to come up and say, this is what needs to be done. It will go out to tender later this year, and then people will have to tender for that. And we're under pressure now to come up with uh, uh, a plan for the, what, the, what the cavity is going to look like. And we actually then spoke to SMEC as well. So we've got SMEC. We paid them 2 million rand already, or we'll pay them soon. Um, and th for that, they're going to come up with a workable model for what this um, cabin is going to look like, how the axis is going to look, and so on. And our, we only have a, a rough estimate. This is going to cost 200 million rand, maybe 300 million. Whether we're going to get the money anywhere, that's the, um, the next uh, question. We still have a, have a sort of um, interim steering committee. We don't have a formal structure yet. If anybody wants to join, you're very welcome. We're not even sure what governance model we're going to have. Uh, Rob Adam, who used to be a DSI in charge of NRF and so on, he thinks being a, a facility of the NRF is not a good idea, <laughs> which I found quite funny. So we won't be like um, Itemba, but we may work uh, with them. Uh, so what do we need? We need some geophysicists to tell us about whether this uh, cavity is good. And maybe, as you could see, there are different areas which are more granitic and some is sandstone. What should we, care, we be careful of? What should we be looking for? And which part is going to be the best? So apart from the muons, there are other measurements that can be done. We certainly need some mining engineers. If anybody knows of a board mining engineer who would like to give us some advice, because when we talk to the engineering company, they ask questions and we don't have the answers. Uh, what we uh, need as well, of course, probably that's the main thing, is we need funding for the cabin. But um, thus far, DSI has seemed to think, well, I'm not. Sure, I'm, I'm sure they're not going to just say here's 200 million rand, but it's luckily not uh, immediate. It's going to be paid over several years, I assume. And it looks as if there's support from other parts in the world, but most people say South Africa better build the thing. Then people will bring their experiments and have collaborative things. I don't think anybody abroad is going to say here's money to build a cavern there, unless they have a specific interest in a an underground lab and they don't have funding for it. 
Uh, here's just a picture. Oh, um, can I go back? Here's a picture of Richard and uh, Farouz Malek, who, as I say, was somehow the driving force, and she's the chairperson of the steering committee, uh, who came up and has really got this going, and she's on the call as well. And Richard now is spending a lot of time looking for it. If you go Google Paul Underground Lab, you will find various things. We After this meeting that we had in uh, January, there were several articles on News24, Nature, and whatever, and there's an archive paper you search on the archive for Paul and uh, whoever's name, you will, uh, you will get that. It has a whole bunch of people who were involved in the discussions thus far. Okay, that's my story. And Lumkile is going to tell you something a bit more about the measurements that we're thinking of and which we want to do uh, before um, Jacques in France will tell you about the new ones. I guess we'll have, I guess we'll have questions at the end. Thank you very much, Prof, for the lovely introduction. Uh, I'm sure by now we do have some geophysicists who would like to come on board after this lovely introduction. Now, uh, it feels good to be here. I was a student here. It feels good to see some old faces as well. Um, we used to have a practical here on Fridays. So uh, it used to be late in the afternoon when I was doing my first year. So I, I see the tradition of doing things late in the afternoon has continued on because, uh, but then the disadvantage is that we never had some lovely refreshments that you guys have for a Friday afternoon. Uh, in absentia, let me also thank the head of department. I don't see her here, Professor Trenen. Uh, she used to be our lecturer. In absentia, I would like to thank her very much for sort of uh, giving us uh, this communication channel to to speak to Stephanie and then organizing this talk. Now she she was uh, she was she was a very inspiring lecturer to us. But then not only that, she she was um, a mother to us as well. Being first years. Now I recall just to to say to the audience that's here, one of the things that I recall about your head of department. Um, you know, I, re I recall her calling the two of us, my, myself and my friend, to her office for being naughty. But then what happened is that we, we lost the key. In fact, I lost the key to my locker, which the locker was situated somewhere in Senate House, now called, I think now it's called Solomon Matlam House. So the, 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 the lockers were there. So I lost the key. Someone picked it up and then decided to help themselves with the belongings that were in the locker. But then we happened to see one of our classmates eating a red apple and the red ha apple happened to be in the locker. And my friend said, hey, 
we've never seen this guy eating a red apple before. So he's the one. So we confronted him and then he went to the head of department, which is Professor Trenden, and then she swiftly scolded, the, scolded us for that. But then, you know, she, she's been a mother to us because, I mean, we could always go back to her whenever we had any other issue, be it personal, academic, and so on. So it feels good to be here. Now, um, after this lovely introduction, my talk is very simple because I just need to talk about news, right? It's a very simple talk that I'm going to do. Now, as you can see, this is what the muon detector looks like. Uh, you have three panels. Uh, so you have three panels there. This is the tunnel that uh, Professor Lindsay has spoken about. And then we, this is the inside of the tunnel that we plan on building this uh, lovely facility, this uh, underground laboratory. So these are all the colleagues. We went to go visit this tunnel. And then uh, um, the lovely lady that you see, um, may her soul rest in peace. She left us uh, earlier on this year. Lovely. Now, I'm just going to give a brief history on uh, muons, right? Now, in 1909, part of the history is that in 1909, uh, Theodore uh, Wolf, he installed a telescope in uh, uh, the Eiffel Tower in Paris. Now, of course, that was the highest structure at that time. It's about 330 meters, right? The idea is he wanted to understand whether the radi radiation that he me measured uh, on ground. Does this radiation come from, from the ground? Or if he were to measure at a higher structure, would he still see radiation, right? So he took his electroscope to the highest point, which is the Eiffel Tower. And then as he expected, um, the radiation levels decreased, but then not to the level that he expected, right? So when they decreased, you could significantly see radiation right at the top of the tower. So there must be some external sort of source that's giving this radiation right at the top of the tower. So this intrigued people and indeed, uh, one of the persons that uh, uh, further on continued to do uh, these uh, measurements was Domenico Passini, all right? So he compared the discharge of his electroscope. So he did measurements on the ground and then later on did measurements uh, on the sea. Now, the idea is if there's some continental crust radioactivity that happens that affects the, the radiation, so he should see the difference if he does measurements on the sea. Uh, he also did some measurements underground, all right? So then he also saw that this uh, atmospheric ions that he measured under, when he, he did underwater, right? So, sorry, he did measurements underwater. So he saw that there's a, uh, there's a significant reduction of these atmospheric ions when you, you measure uh, underwater. Um, and then, of course, this is a modern day uh, Domenico Passini with his uh, electroscope trying to measure the discharge of the electroscope there. Now, uh, in 1912, Victor Hess, right, he, he used balloons. So he, he took this electroscope, this Wolf electroscope, and then he put them in hot air balloons. And then he did to a height of about 5.2 kilometers to measure this atmospheric ions to see the difference up there. He did, he did uh, some measurements at night as well, all right? So that sort of eliminates if there's a, this, uh, if, if you want to know if there's a, an effect on a non-solar radi radioactivity, right, during the night, you would still measure radi radiation. Indeed, with those five air balloons that he did measurements at night, he could see radiation. By the way, Victor Hess went, went on to measure, uh, well, he went on to win the Nobel Prize in 1936. Um, that's because later on, uh, around about 1936, two physicists in uh, Caltech laboratory, they, uh, they did some measurements, all right? And then they find the path of curvature uh, in their uh, cloud chamber, all right? It followed a certain trajectory, which is strange and sort of gave a behavior that's similar, that's, that's in between an electron and a proton, 
and they couldn't understand what it is. Okay, later on, of course, it was they found out that it's muons, and we know muons, of course, is the subatomic particle that we know that okay, it's got properties similar to similar to that of an electron, but it, it's just that two hundred times heavier than an electron. Now, how are muons formed, right? So you have cosmic rays heating the atmosphere, all right? Atmosphere, atmospheric nuclei are being heated by these cosmic rays. In the process, you have uh, pions that are being formed. The pions, when they decay, they decay into muons. These muons have uh, extremely high energy and they're highly penetrative. So now, we did some measurements uh, in Stellenbosch and uh, at UWC. So what you see there is this, is this uh, uh, muon telescope that measures the, the muons. It's placed right in, uh, at UWC at the moment. The idea is later on, uh, at the, towards the end of the month, we're going to take this muon telescope to, to the tunnel. At the moment, we're just doing some measurements in open sky. That just uh, forms part of... Uh, the calibration and so on. So it's got three panels as well. All right, so your middle panel acts as a veto against your random coincidences. Now, coming to muons and uh, uh, some physics, what, what sort of physics do, 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 do muon tell, tell us? Um, if we think of muons, the average lifetime of a muon is 2.2 microseconds. Now, classic, if you were to, to sort of measure if muons traveled at the speed of light and uh, uh, you wanted to know the distance that they will travel, it would be around about 660, 660 meters. Now, the atmosphere, typically the distance uh, from the atmosphere to the Earth ranges from 10, 20, 30 kilometers. You wouldn't expect a muon with an average lifetime of... Uh, 2.2 microseconds to reach the atmosphere, I mean, to reach the, the, the Earth, right? But then um, what happens that if it travels at relativistic speeds, right, which is closer to the speed of light, something happens, which is time dilation, right? Now, this is the equation for time dilation. It simply means if something travels closer to the speed of light, the time passes slowly. Uh, I'm sure many of you uh, will have heard of the twin par paradox. One twin remains here on Earth and another one travels to space close to the speed of light. When he comes back, the, older, the, the other twin is, has become older and this one is still young, right? It's because of time dilation, right? Time passes slowly, right? Now, if muons were to travel at the speed of 99.99% the speed of light, then they would travel a distance of 66 kilometers as opposed to the 660 meters. So that's how muons reach the Earth. And that's how they can even penetrate underground as well because they travel at these very high energies. Now, if we were to look at things from a different perspective, from a muon uh, perspective, what does the muon see, right? Um, from the muon's pers perspective, what it sees is what we call length contraction, right? In that instance, the Earth and the atmosphere are traveling at relativi relativistic speeds, right? Which is, if muons travel at, uh, in this case, okay, if we consider if, uh, the Earth and the, the atmosphere travel at 99.995% uh, of the speed of light, then the length will sort of contract, okay? So that would mean from the muon's perspective, 50 kilometers is 500 meters. That's from a muon's perspective, right? Length contraction. So that's how muons tell us something about physics, uh, this theory of relativity. Now, uh, I see my colleagues in physics are smiling, so th that should be right. Uh, now, what do muons tell us maybe 
can they tell us anything about geology? Uh, we know that X-rays, X-rays take advantage of the variation in density in, in, in bodies, right? Or in matter, whatever it does, right? It takes advantage of the variation in density. Your makeup as a human being, you've got soft tissue and then you've got these bones that are more dense, right? So there's a variation of density in your makeup, in your in your makeup as a as a human being. That's how we can tell fractures that uh, in your bones and so on. We use X-rays, right? They penetrate, they travel at this speed and then they penetrate your body and then we can use this variation in density to sort of locate where the fracture is. Now, we can use muons as well, right? Muons, uh, we can use imaging, muon imaging or myography. And we look at structures, whether natural structures or man-made structures to look at, uh, to, that will tell us what happens with that uh, uh, density variation in a structure. If you were to look at a natural structure like a mountain and so on, in this case, uh, this result that I'm going to show now is they could find that there's a new void in a pyramid using muons, right? Myography could tell that, okay, uh, here, you can see there's a new uh, there's a void in a pyramid, right? That's a natural structure, and indeed, myography is being used to look at things like blast furnaces. There's papers uh, published to look at things like blast furnaces, and there's papers that's been published to look at uh, to look at uh, nuclear reactors, the inside of the nuclear reactor that you cannot go into. You just look, you place a muon detector outside, and then you you can see what happens inside. Now, of course, what I've shown was just 2D, right? We know that technology has advanced. Now we can get 3D scans of human. But then the way that works is that you just take X-rays at different positions and then combine that. Eventually you come with a 3D CT scan, right? The same thing with the muons. You could take a detector, your muon detector, you place it at different different locations, eventually you come up with a 3D scan. Now, there's certain parameters that affect muons, of course. One of them is uh, uh, altitude. This result that you see there shows you how uh, the ion pairs in the atmosphere with increasing altitude, how they increase. Now, other things, of course, would be temperature, and pressure variations, uh, the result that I'm showing is a paper that's been published in uh, Ottawa in Canada. Uh, other things, of course, would be your geomagnetic latitude and so on. So there's certain parameters that affect muons. Now, of course, also there's several processes that affect the slowing down of muons as they interact with matter, right? They slow down. Those things include the kinetic energy of the muons, right? It affects and the density of the medium, the chemical composition of the medium, all right? Now, uh, if we want to look at all of these nat natural structures and so on, we can come up with, we can try and understand what happens or how muons propagate through matter in a standard rock. So we can define what a, st a standard rock is, all right? It's a crystalline quartz with a density that much about 2.65 grams per cubic centimeter. And then the, the, the A there, which is the atomic number. Uh, no, 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 A is the, is the mass. The A is the mass, which is about 22 grams per mole, and Z, which is the atomic number, is 11. That's standard rock. Now we can try and see how they propagate through standard rock here. Now, physicists, uh, if they want to know how charged particles traverse through a medium, right? They use what we call the stopping power. And of course, there's, uh, there's uh, the beta pack uh, uh, formulas and so on that will tell you how charged particles traverse through a, 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 a medium, right? Now, if you look at the stopping power, you can tell how muons traverse through rock. Now, there's different, of course, interaction processes that muons use, and those depend on their energies. 
the dominant processes, all right, uh, between 500 GV, GeV and lower, that's ionization. All right, if you look at higher energies like 693 GeV, then uh, the processes that you think of or that will affect uh, the, the muon traveling through a dense uh, structure would be the prem straling, pair production, and photonuclear. Now, here is again, if you look at the total mean stopping power pl plotted as a function of the kinetic energy for three different rock densities, all right? If you look at three different rock densities, then you can tell that uh, total uh, mean stopping power is a function of energy, all right? And again, you, you can look at the muon flux, muon flux as a function of the opacity, right? Now, um, of course, we, with the, with the uh, uh, muon telescope that we have, and very, fairly recently, we've now started to look at the data. Uh, I'm just showing you now just uh, one run, all right? The time distributions, um, you know, uh, uh, different time distributions there. And then if you set your coincidence, maybe at uh, 200 microseconds and so on, if you want to get rid of coincidences and so on, there's a time distributions. If you wanted to look at the time difference between a current event and a, pre a previous event, then you plot your time distributions and so on. Now, uh, one of the panels, if you look at the uh, detector, will have 64 channels. One panel has 64 channels, right? Now, this is uh, uh, the results from just one of the panels. And of course, statistics are not good because it's just one run. Yeah, so the, 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 the an, uh, analysis of this uh, data, which is, we are still coll collecting the data anyway, is ongoing. And then uh, uh, now I will just hand over to our colleague in France, Jacques, who's going to now talk more about geosciences and muons, I thank you. Can you see my screen? Yes, we can. Okay, wonderful. So, should I start? Yes, please start. <laughs> okay, very nice. So, thanks for uh, having organized this uh, nice uh, seminar. And uh, thanks for the two uh, introduction by uh, Robbie and uh, Lumkide. I think that I will... Uh, uh, gain some time because you have now all the basics and all the features of uh, myography. So, as it was explained by uh, Lumkile, the idea is to exploit this uh, radiation that comes from the sky. And uh, uh, the largest part of this uh, uh, radiation, the atmospheric radiation, is uh, made out of muons, those uh, strange particles. And so, the idea, I hope that the, the, the slide that changed. Okay, the idea uh, is summarized in this uh, slide. So you see here uh, a mountain. This is the dome of a volcano in Iceland. And uh, I have drawn here uh, symbolically a shower, atmospheric shower of ele uh, elementary particles crossing the dome of this uh, mountain. And uh, you see the detector, the three plane detector that is uh, placed just uh, uh, after the, the mountain and receiving the flux of the particle crossing the mountain. And of course, some of the particles are uh, absorbed by the matter 
of the, the mountain. And so what you measure directly is an attenuation curve uh, that you will convert after the resolution of an inverse problem into a density map of the inner matter inside the, the, the mountain itself. So roughly speaking, this is the equivalent of medical imaging. Uh, you see it in a, a small picture uh, underneath. This is uh, exactly the equivalent. By replacing the X-rays by uh, muon rays, uh, replacing detectors uh, surrounding the body by our uh, muon detectors, and of course, uh, looking at large scale volumes. So, as uh, Lumkili said, the probes that we're using are elementary particles. So you have here on the bottom uh, sketch, all the 12 elementary particles known uh, nowadays. So six so-called quarks and six leptons. Among the leptons, you know the electron and the muon now, which is a cousin of the electron as far as uh, its properties are concerned, but for its mass and but for its uh, lifetime, which is limited. And the mass is the big issue because the 200 uh, times more massive, uh, more important mass uh, of the muon uh, gives it an uh, interaction cross-section, which is by far lower than the one of the electrons. The origin of the muon and uh, the origin of the cosmic rays is still not completely clear. Uh, we, we, we think that it comes from the explosion of a star supernovae and so on and so forth. And that these cosmic rays travel uh, all along the universe and are bended and uh, accelerated through the electromagnetic field that they, they define in the galaxies and uh, in between the galaxies. But origin is not completely, completely clear. What is really clear is the chain of production of the muons, as uh, it was described just before. And the uh, cosmic rays, which are mainly high energy protons, eating the top layers of the atmosphere and generating the shower of uh, elementary particles through the decays of pions, you will find the muon, and the muon will propagate from the top layers of the atmosphere down to the ground. At the ground level, you have to keep in mind that the rate is uh, of the order of one particle per square centimeter per minute. This is to give you the scale of uh, the, the signal, the maximal value of signal that we can get at the surface level. There are some uh, small variation uh, which are induced by uh, barometric parameters, by uh, characteristic of the, the atmosphere, altitude, latitude, geomagnetic effect, and so on and so forth. But more or less, this is stable uh, within plus or minus 15%. This is uh, completely constant, uh, stable uh, in each point of this planet. Okay, so this is really a reference uh, radiation flux that we have and that we get, and that is completely for free, and that we will exploit in the muography measurement. The, there are many ways of detecting those muons in particle physics. Uh, you see muons have been discovered almost one century ago. These are charged particle, uh, negative or positive. So this is quite easy. And the basic idea is that you want to take a small part of the energy of the muons and you convert this energy inside your detector into a, a signal that you can measure. So the detector that we are using are based on scintillator, and you have the sketch of the detection of the muon, which is uh, described above. Basically, the muon leaves its energy. The energy is converted uh, into a flash of uh, scintillation light. The light is trapped into an optical fiber and is driven 
inside this optical fiber to uh, a photomultiplier, photosensor, or whatever. This is one way of detecting the muons. And if you make an array of X and Y uh, scintillator strips, then you define a pixel and you are able to identify in which pixel the muon uh, passed. You can detect muons also with the nuclear emulsions, which are the former, uh, let's say, uh, photographic emulsions used in the former devices to make photos, in former cameras. You can uh, also detect muons in the so-called RPCs or micromegas, which are gaseous detectors. And here, the energy of the muon is converted into an avalanche of electron. And so you detect a signal in charge. Okay, but basically you see that all those detectors are of the same type. You have parallel planes of roughly speaking one square meter, because this is something that you want to manipulate by hand. So you have parallel planes and all the planes are pixelized. And when the muon uh, crosses the planes, he left a signal inside the, the, the different planes and you can reconstruct the trajectory of the incident muon. This is why those detectors are called trackers, because you may reconstruct the track of the incident muon. And so since you have the direction of the incident muons, you can count in all the direction uh, available uh, to the detector. So what we call the acceptance of the detector, you can count exactly how many track you get per time unit, and you can compare this measured number with the expected number in the absence of the target. And of course, the comparison of both gives you the attenuation induced by the target. So as Lumkile uh, was presenting, there are many, many um, different uh, measurements of uh, myography nowadays. When I started this activity 15 years ago, we were almost a couple of teams all around the world. Now you type myography on the web, and you will see that there are plenty of teams who claim that they are doing myography. To anticipate the question that you will have, what is the resolution of the measurement and uh, what is the time needed to make a measurements? The correct answer is it depends. It depends on the volume that you want to image and it depends on uh, the uh, size of the density anomaly you want to spot. Here, if you want to take the image of a great pyramid, like the one which is depicted in the top uh, picture, you will need of the order of a one month of uh, data taking. And the resolution will be of the order of the cubic meter. Now you see the S and L uh, letters, which have been designed for the test. They are at the scale of the centimeter. You see that the resolution is at the millimeter level. And this is a picture that you can take in a couple of hours. So from hours to months, from cubic meter to uh, cubic millimeter, you have all the range of possible measurements. What is for sure, the two, uh, the, the, the common point of all those measurements as this is the case for the medical imaging, is that what you see is not a direct measurement. It is indirect measurement in the sense that you take raw data and then you need the reconstruction. You need to solve an inverse problem in order to get the image. Okay, This is not a direct vision like uh, with the microscope. Now, the inverse problem that you have to solve is completely constrained by the physics. If I take the sketch, which is on the left, we basically exploit three types of tracks. The more energy, the most energy particles in blue, they cross the block of matter, which is in gray, without being scattered and with the minimal loss of energy. The red one, the low energy particle, they will be absorbed completely by the block of matter. And the intermediate energy particles, they will cross the block of matter, but they will um, undergo a scattering. Okay? So you can measure either the attenuation of the flux, so the red particle typically, or the scattering of the particles, the green trajectory typically, 
And those two processes, the first one governed by the energy loss per unit lengths uh, of matter uh, crossed, the second one being uh, governed by the so-called multiple column scattering, those two processes are well constrained, well known, they are well documented, and there are plenty of measurements that have been done on them. And this is basically the physical processes that you exploit in order to solve your inverse problem. So in order to allow you to go from the measured data to the distribution of matter, the most probable distribution of matter that gave rise to this raw data. One very interesting feature of the myography of the muons is that they are available 24 hours a day, seven days a week. And so you can use this method to monitor the behavior of the inner part of your target. This is, for example, a small experiment that we have done by putting a detector below a water tank. There were something like five meters of water inside the water tank. And you see the blue curve here with the variation of the water level inside the water tank. And you see that this variation was more or less minus one meter, so something like 20% variation. In black, in the middle curve, you see the muon flux variation in anti-correlation with the water level. Of course, the less water, the more muon, because you have less matter to stop the muon. And you see the perfect anti-correlation that you get between the muon flux measured and the water level. What is also very interesting is that with the green curve, you get the atmospheric pressure measured during this measurement. And you see also the anti-correlation between the atmospheric pressure and the muon flux. Because of course, atmospheric pressure means the weight of the air column that you, uh, we have above our head. And the larger this column, the less muon because uh, they are more absorbed. So this is an effect that we know perfectly and we know that we have to correct uh, for this barometric uh, variation of the muon flux. But nevertheless, once you correct this, uh, you have a nice uh, measurement tool for all the monitoring effects for what is inside your target. The three main domains in which myography is applied nowadays are geosciences. So volcanology, I will give example, uh, geology, hydrology, atmosphere, physics, and so on and so forth. Archaeology, you have heard of the Scan Pyramid project and you have seen the image uh, in the previous talk. And this is also used nowadays for industrial controls, non-invasive and non-destructive controls for all the uh, heavy infrastructures, heavy industrial infrastructures. Okay, but I will not talk uh, of this today. An example in the volcanoes, and uh, uh, we have made many experiments on, on different types of volcanoes, and I will focus on one of those volcanoes, which is the Soufrière, uh, of Guadeloupe, which is in the Lesser Antilles, and which is uh, a volcano which is known to have a very active hydrothermal system. And uh, this is mainly because uh, the, the volcano uh, endures uh, heavy rains all along the year, and there is a lot of water inside the system. The water uh, gets in contact with the magma, and uh, there is a mix a mixture between steam, uh, liquid wa uh, water, and so on and so forth, and this evolves in time. So this is a really nice and very interesting and complicated hydrothermal system that people want to understand. So the first idea was to put detectors all around the dome and to take uh, typical myography images. And you see here the images that we get uh, for those uh, measurements. So in uh, red, the dense zones. In blue, the uh, less dense zones. So the negative anomaly, the negative density anomalies in, in blue and the positive density anomalies in red. So as expected, we see that there are some big holes, big cavities in the center of the volcano, but we see also that there are 
interesting and very active cavities close to the surface, which corresponds to uh, the actual uh, craters of the uh, of the volcano itself. And so we have equipped this uh, this volcano with up to six muon detectors, uh, putting them inside uh, the faults, uh, putting them, uh, lifting them with the helicopter and so on and so forth. So we, we design a quite a robust detector that nowadays uh, we, we can send uh, uh, everywhere. What has to be clear, and this is where the link with the geoscience has to be made, is that this uh, measurements, this myography measurements, comes as a complement to other classical, let's say, standard geophysics measurements. For instance, in this uh, benchmark of the Soufrière of the Guadeloupe, we have made uh, three different trials to couple the measurements that we have done with the myography with other uh, geophysical measurements. The first one is a, a seismologic measurements that has been done with the geophones at the summit of the volcano. And we have seen that here there was a time coincidence between a sharp increase in the muon flux in one of the direction of the of the detector, the red curve, and this came in coincidence with an increase of the noise inside the geophones. And by reconstructing the volume uh, giving rise to this noise in the geophones, we find that the volume exactly corresponds to the directions of uh, the line of sights of the muon detector. So we, we managed to correlate the volume, the full volume of uh, this uh, uh, noise uh, generating uh, volume inside the, the dome of the volcano. So the interpretation, of course, is that there was a, a big volume and that it was filled with water and that the water uh, was uh, somehow uh, uh, leaving the, the, the place and so the opacity decreased and so the muon flux increases. Another nice feature is that myography is sensitive to the density of the medium. So this is exactly the same observable as gravimetry. And so you can join the analysis of myography data and gravimetry data. And you can make a single matrix and you can make a single data inversion of both the data sets, giving interesting features because they have absolutely not the same kernels. And so you can resolve and improve the resolution of both methods by making this joint analysis. And this is what we have done. And this is what we have obtained on the left. This is the muon plus gravimetry uh, joint inversion. This is a slice of the 3D reconstructed dome that we, are, that we have done at that time. And on the right, this is the electrical resistive uh, tomography, which has been done of the same dome at the same altitude. And you see that the large conductivity zones in the center of the dome corresponds to the low density measured uh, myography plus gravimetry measurements, which corresponds to zones where there is a lot of water uh, explaining the conductivity and the, the density uh, zones. So there is a nice, very nice correlation in between the two measurements. And this is why I say that this myography stuff is a good complement for geology of the geophysical measurement. So this is exactly the plan that we would like to, to, to apply in uh, within the poll project. And I will show you an example of uh, what we have done uh, in another underground lab, which is called Monterrey, which is in Switzerland, in Europe, so northern uh, hemisphere, which is something like uh, uh, 300 kilometers from my place in Lyon. And you see here the two profiles on the top, the uh, pole tunnel, and on the bottom, the Monterrey tunnel, which is also an highway. Okay, this is a tunnel for uh, vehicles. And of course, the Monterey uh, is uh, uh, not so high as the uh, Parle Mountain uh, is, but you will see that uh, I put here the, a little bit of uh, scale, the, the same scale to, to get an ID, but you will see what we have done in the Monterey, what could be done in the uh, Paul project, within the Paul project, by uh, making uh, interdisciplinary measurements between geophysics and physics. 
So this is the first uh, measurements, basic measurements that we have done by moving the detector all along the tunnel and by looking at the acceptance uh, from different points. And you see here the different attenuation curve that you get with respect to the zenith angle, which is exactly the reproduction of the uh, topography of the overburden. So this is really the first exercise, and this is exactly the first measurements that we intend to do this year within the, the, the pole tunnel, starting from the, um, let's say, most central parts where there is the largest overburden and going uh, to the entrance and going close to the, to the entrance. Second stuff that we have done in the Monterey is to take some gravimetry measurements at the surface in the tunnel and by making the joint inversion between myography and gravimetry. And you see here, the geology of this mountain is very well known. There is clay, there is limestone, there is marl and so on and so forth. Four different areas with the four different densities. And you see by making a joint inversion, how well we can separate the four different densities of the four different areas, which is, uh, so this is the bottom line. And this is not feasible neither with the gravimetry alone nor with the myography alone. And only the joint inversion uh, is uh, giving the, the good separation in densities. And this is really tough measurements, challenging, but very interesting because this is a very clean way of characterizing the, the, the geology, which is above our head with a minimal number of measured points, let's say. What is very interesting also is that by leaving the detector counting for a long time, you can measure the oscillation and the flux. And here, for example, we spotted uh, a huge uh, increase of the flux for one month. So a huge increase for a couple of weeks and huge decrease for a couple of weeks. And this was actually correlated with the, what we call the sudden uh, stratospheric warming. So warming of the atmosphere then the opacity of the atmosphere suddenly decreased on a very short time scale. And so the muon can cross the atmosphere very much more easily. And so uh, we have here uh, an effective temperature co coefficient, which is alpha T, which is a reference in the literature. And you see the measurement point that we had in red compared with the other large scale experiments underground experiment like Macro, Borexino, all those experiments in Gran Sasso, but also Ice Cube, Amanda, which were um, experiment in the South Pole. And you see that with our small detector, we uh, were able to have um, uh, a precise point, which is exactly fitting the curve of all the big experiments installed in the underground lab. So this would be very nice if we could observe this uh, stratospheric warmings from the uh, South Hemisphere. So this is uh, one of the wish that, uh, that I have. So this is exactly what we want to do, having uh, moving the detector that uh, you have shown just before within the Igno tunnel and uh, making uh, uh, those types of uh, uh, myography measurements all along the tunnel. I will skip those archeology span uh, parts. Sorry for this, but Okay, this will this will be too long. Just I want to focus on uh, on uh, on the final pictures of our uh, adventure starting in uh, South Africa. So the idea was to send uh, the three plane detector. Okay, we put this detector inside uh, one uh, big box uh, because it was more practical, both from a logistic point of view and for the measurement point of view, because we will just measure uh, stuff at the zenith. And so you see the detector on the right, which was prepared in my lab in France. Then it was sent to South Africa, received in Stellenbosch, making a first measurement campaign, campaign in Stellenbosch in this, uh, in this place. And then you see this on the trailer going from Stellenbosch to UWC. So this is really the and uh, the traveling detector. 
And meanwhile, on the left, uh, I had time to just confirm that the detector is working very uh, smoothly. You see the so-called acceptance figure, which is basically all the direction of, uh, of the muons crossing the detector. So this is, uh, let's say, a, a check, uh, internal check of, uh, of the way the detector works. And this is actually very encouraging. And now we are transferring the know-how to our uh, South African colleague in order that they take the data, start the data analysis. And by the end of the month, this guy will move again from UWC to the inner part of the tunnel, starting really uh, to look at the attenuation of the muons inside the uh, Huguenot tunnel. And this is my uh, usual conclusion. Uh, you see that myography nowadays has become very popular, so popular that even the New York Times uh, devoted a uh, full article on the subject and uh, how to use cosmic ray particles to see inside the volcano. And uh, so this is basically my conclusion. So stay tuned. And of course, this would be very nice if we could have geophysicists joining the project to start the characterization of the geology of the nice place. Uh, thank you very much for attention. Okay, maybe we should start with questions specifically to Jacques, because I can imagine seeing uh... Uh, chips and beer here. We'll probably end up chatting for quite a while, but uh, specific questions, I guess, for Jacques would be the best way to start. If any of the geophysicists want to know, of course, you know, um, uh, you can email him or us and uh, get into contact uh, quite easily. Uh, yep. Hey, uh, yeah, that was a great talk. I was just curious. Um... When a muon attenuates, what happens to that energy? Does it just get uh, does it just get absorbed into an um, an atom or something? Or yes, actually, this is this is completely absorbed by the matter. Uh, we we always this is this is a, a good comment. We always speak of high energy physics, but for sure. Uh, this is those particular are, are high energy, but they are also infinitesimal. So the amount of energy at the end is really a small one. So you you can imagine that the, the, the this is converted into phonons, into whatever heat, uh, and, and this is dissipated into the matter. There is also the fact that the muon itself is not stable, so it can decay. And uh, the muon decay gives an electron plus two neutrinos. So neutrino completely escape the matter without leaving any track or really little. And the electron is being absorbed uh, quite immediately. Okay, I see there's a hand up on Zoom from Lou Ashwell. Go ahead, uh, unmute and, and unmute. Hi. 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 Oh, st sorry. Is that better? Are are you still getting an echo? No, that's that's better. Yeah, that's fine. Okay, great. Sorry, it's it's Sue Webb here, a geophysicist. Um, I was wondering about the um the the muon directions. Are you move that thing away? Sorry, we're we're having speaker trouble. <laughs> uh, um, I, I, yeah, the, I think the, the direction the of the muon coming in. Are you? You said you were able to track that. Are you? Is that sufficient um, angularity to do tomography just from the direction the muons are coming in, or does that not? Is, is the kind of window, if you will, too small um, to to really see that? And then I guess a, another question was um, Joel Jensen did some work in a mine um, with muon tomography, looking for an ore body over a, above an ore, ore body that was mined out below. And I'm wondering if you see any applications for that, um, perhaps in South Africa. Yeah, so uh, good points. So first on the direction, of course, 
we so basically the 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 most uh, abundant uh, direction is the zenith okay because this is the shortest path from the top of the atmosphere down to the surface and uh, when you got inclination you get roughly speaking uh, an attenuation law which uh, goes like cosine square theta where theta is the zenith angle so this is something that runs pretty well from zero to 80 degrees zenith angle so close to the close to the horizon and this is something that is well known and that you can simulate using monte carlo generator very precisely and this is your reference flux and this reference flux then uh, gives you the amount of particles that you await inside the direction so if with your detector you're able to measure the direction precisely which at the scale of uh, one cubic meter you can do uh, quite easily then you get your answer for the for the tomography unfortunately we cannot measure much more than this because measuring the energy of those particles would require much more elaborated detectors that are not compatible with the field operation. Okay, so of course, once we will have the pole uh, laboratory and the ground laboratory installed, then inside we will have very nice and uh, smart detectors and we will have calorimeters, we will have a magnetic field, we will have whatever we want, whatever detector uh, runs usually at CERN, for example. And with this, you are able to measure the energy of particle, you're, measured to, you're able to measure the momentum, you're able to identify and uh, make the distinction between muons and electrons and so on and so forth. And you make a much more precise measurement. But for the time being, we leave with the tracks. As you understood concerning these tracks, you measure only the events which are above the horizon of the detector because you are detecting something which comes from the atmosphere. So with the muography only, you cannot see below. This is for sure, okay? This is uh, an intrinsic limitation of the, the method. You cannot see below. So if you want to detect an old body, if you want to make application for mining, and there are already application of mining, there are people looking for uranium, for example, in the Canada. But you have to put your detector below. So you can imagine that you have a pit or you have an underground tunnel or you have whatever. You put your detector inside and you look at uh, some uh, uh, old body above your head. So if there is uranium in the Parle mountain, okay, probably we could see an increase in density. We could see a positive density anomaly in our data. And so uh, I think that this will give another perspective to the project. But uh, <laughs> this was not the first goal. <laughs> Yeah, but I mean, that's, that's, a, that's a question I was going to ask people here. I mean, if you're in the Moab Kotsong mine, which is three kilometers deep, surely you could then, uh, everything isn't known above where, where you are in your passage down there. Is no, does anybody know if anyone has used muons for that? Okay, we can talk about that afterwards. Um, there's another question. The next stand up, I think, is from uh, Anthony Rutherford. Yeah, hi. Good evening. Thank you for the talk. Uh, perhaps directed to yourself and to to uh, Professor Martineau. Um Besides the muography, what other experiments do you see taking place in the laboratory? I'm assuming it's not going to be a 200 rand, million rand um, measurement of a mountain. You, you're going to be conducting other experiments. What 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 would be the purpose, or what experiments could you be seeing? Yeah, no, abs absolutely. Um, the traditional one that's been done underground is to measure neutrinos because, uh, again, neutrinos have such a small cross-section when they interact with matter that you need swimming pool size uh, detectors. And then, of course, you don't want a um, uh, background. So you don't want to have any of the muons. The, the muons will be a background, but you, you get you know, like uh, two or three counts a month or two or three counts a year in some 
cases. So you don't want any background, which is traditionally the main thing why people had underground labs. But uh, Borexino in Italy, for example, uh, made a living out of measuring neutrinos. But the big new thing is to measure dark matter. I mean, as you probably know, the astronomers are convinced that there's a lot of dark matter in the universe. And there are now, I don't know, just in Canada, in the one uh, lab that I was in, there were four or five dark matter experiments where people are in different ways uh, measuring dark, uh, trying to measure dark matter at different masses and whatever. The idea is that you would get some um, things called axions or whatever, which would interact with material in some way. So you have like a nuclear detector of some kind, and you're looking for this effect. And it's a, it's a kind of needle in a haystack because you don't know exactly what you're looking for, but it's really is seen by uh, physicists as it'll change the, how we understand physics if it is found. So there's uh, endless money for those uh, experiments. So yeah, I mean, there are people at the, at the conference that we had in January, there were at least two groups who said that if you had a lab, we would come and, 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 and use it. Would you, would you, would you foresee at some stage installing a, a, a neutrino detector? I mean, as you say, it's a um, lot of... Uh, that, that depends on size and so on. Neutrino detectors usually need, need a lot of, of uh, a volume. At the moment, I think we're thinking more of dark matter searches. But sorry, what I forgot got to say is there are lots of other things which people measure in underground labs as well. People look at um, uh, uh, biology experiments. Um, I was quite amazed. There are several biological things which get affected by background radiation like muons as well. And people are very interested in what happens when you are in an environment where that is not present. That's yeah. the one thing. And the other one is also um, measuring uh, with uh, HPGE detectors, measuring things very accurately. Uh, if you take a core sample, for example, and you want to see how much uranium is in it, then it will be minute quantities. And so you want to be able to measure that at a level which you can't do above ground because of the background. So in a snow lab, for example, there's a whole, array, a whole a row of um, uh, HPG, HPGE detectors um, standing there measuring things. People who are interested in climate change, for example, are often interested in measuring uh, uh, cores of various kinds which have been measured. So there are lots of other applications as well. The impression we got that is if we had a lab, there would be people who would uh, want to utilize it. Yeah, but, yeah, as the, the, you, as, uh, but as you said, so, sorry, Jacques, as you said, yeah, yeah, uh, Robbie, uh, it depends on, on, on the size of uh, the, the facility. If the size is as big as one of the uh, Grand Sasso platform, then we can do all, the, all of this, uh, including a neutrino experiment. If the size is uh, as uh, small as uh, Modan, which is uh, is big but a <laughs> small small facility, then one can make neutrino uh, uh, physics as well as dark matter, but with a limited uh, number of uh, of experiment. That, that's it. I mean, but w what we expect, what we would like to have with Paul is. Uh, is a facility which is close to one of the platform of Grand Sasso. So that, that could be really, really an opportunity to do many, many things, uh, including biophysics and, and seismology and whatever, all the things that you, you were talking about, uh, Robbie. Thank you. Yeah, I mean, there, there is a, a growth in this field. Uh, China is building a very, very deep uh, uh, underground laboratory. Uh, Australia is building one, especially to have one in the Southern Hemisphere to uh, combined with the Northern Hemisphere. Modan in France, there was uh, a lot of plans for expanding it, though it hasn't uh, happened. And uh, there's the one in Andes, which people want to build there. So yeah, I get the impression there's a, there's a need for these things. Okay, I see another hand from Stephanie Enslin. Stephanie, thanks very much for setting this up, and, and especially to Lumkile, who got a hold of you and uh, got uh, the whole uh, thing happening. <laughs> I have a huge apology. I really thought the whole thing was going to be online. That's why I'm sitting at home. So I have a huge apology that I'm not there in the office with you. I'm well, sorry. Uh, 
No, that, that's partly my fault because I didn't decide that whether I was definitely going to come up uh, until about last week. So there, there was a bit of, con- oh, sure. there, there was understandably some confusion. <laughs> And but I know we, Sue, but, who's already asked a question, she's at home because she's not well. And Prof Ray Durham and Prof Musa and Prof Gordon are all the geophysicists. We're all traveling. Um, but I, they were aware of the talk. And so I'm glad it's recorded so we can look at it. Um, so it's been very interesting to hear. So, I mean, when you say you want a geophysicist on board, what would it really entail? Just attending project meetings. I, it was great to see the data uh, that's been done in other areas, including the density, uh, sorry, the gravity data and joint inversions and seismics as well. So, I mean, it sounds like a very exciting project. But yeah, what would you need on our side? That uh, just just a comment before you answer, Rabbi. Uh, the example I took, uh, uh, the Monterey Underground Lab, is a lab which has been designed for methodological developments in geophysics. So there are plenty of, uh, uh, let's say, uh, ongoing experiments, including R&Ds and a new method in geophysics. And the underground lab is uh, completely devoted to this. So you have tunnels, you have boreholes. Uh, you can uh, heat up some uh, some of the boreholes for uh some application uh, that that you that you can uh, that you can guess uh so there are many 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 uh small uh, developments uh, for small teams and all of them are developing testing uh the new methods uh, new detectors and so on and so forth and so this it, this was the the my id uh, first of uh, sp- let's say, uh, trying to convince the colleague of uh, trying to 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 have geophysicists uh, involved is because there could be also uh, quite a nice uh, overview and uh, use of this uh, lab as a benchmark for uh, uh, geophysical methods. Uh, it uh, can assume that the overburden is well characterized. I have seen that the geology is quite complicated. You have faults, you have uh, different, uh, very interesting parts. Uh, you have perhaps uh, karstic systems uh, with uh, uh, water filling inside. And so you, we could have, have uh, uh, hydrogeology also uh, experiment running in these parts. So I think that there could be uh, a vast number of subjects uh, very interesting for geophysicists. And of course, after this, we can join the methods, uh, myography, and uh, all the uh, the method that you know uh, better than me. This was just my my comment. Robbie, if you want to, to add something. No, no, thanks, Jacques. I was going to throw it in your uh, your court in any case. I mean, you all saw the, the um, map which I showed, and I think Lumkili showed, uh, no, which um, Jacques showed as well, of the mountain. That, as you can see, is from a, is a photocopy <laughs> from a journal by the engineers who built the tunnel that was written in about 1980, and it says, uh, 1990, sorry, published in 1990, and it says at the bottom, uh, the sort of uh, post-tunnel building uh, model. In other words, they found some things which were different to what they thought beforehand. So I have no idea how accurate those geological measurements are. The um, engineering company that's been working on it now, they have done some measurements, but I don't know why, uh, I don't know what, and I don't know how much, and I doubt if they want to tell us they're very worried about IP and things like that. So I'm sure that some geophysicists could tell us something about the mountain and and, uh, do something, I would guess, or even just comment on what is known and what is uh, not known. I mean, we are uh, uh, certainly not geologists. Yeah, I would love to add to that and to answer to uh, Stephanie, uh, uh, question about uh, what we can, what they can do, what geophysicists will, uh, can do now, and uh, how can they join, and what for. So uh, there are two uh, two parts. One, one is joining uh, the uh, the effort that is is being done with the myography group uh, to characterize a mountain in view of. Uh, building this uh, this facility because we w- we want to have this characterization of the f- of fault or, or or the burden or the mountain itself before we 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 we, we make the design of, uh, of the facility and we build it so this is the first uh, the first part and the other part is what jack was saying um, above that, uh, there are so many things to do in an underground lab. So there are many experiments that you geophysicists would like to 
to uh, to create <laughs> or to build yourself uh, doing in a, an underground uh, lab. So you will probably bring new ideas, new experiment, and new project uh, within Paul. Uh, Paul is a facility, so it's just uh, a um, I mean a tool that you will be using to do your geophysics uh, projects. So this is how I see it. Uh, how how you can you can add a value to this uh, poll project by joining uh, by jo joining us and you can do it just now <laughs> I mean you just uh, be in meeting and the special muon or geophysics meeting like we we do uh, today I mean it's just fantastic seminar that is uh, has been organized today and I'm really happy with that so I'll be happy that uh, I, we will see you. Uh, from now on, uh, belonging to our uh, project and 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 do your your own task and and and, uh, and look for uh, for what you can do in with the Paul uh, project. That is my my point of view. Thanks. Okay. It sounds exciting. Yeah. Thank you. Okay. Thanks. Thank thanks. Th thanks, Farouz. Uh, Farouz, we now have a, a colleague of yours on the um, Atlas experiment um, uh, from the physics department at WITS. Uh, Ilias uh, Sidras Haddad uh, has got a question. He's here in the audience. Yes, uh, I just want to go back to the physics a bit. Uh, you mentioned uh, two particular interests, uh, neutrino physics and uh, 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 dark matter. Now, a neutrino, I'm just wondering if the 800 meters of tunnel would be enough to actually do any kind of interesting work with neutrinos. Because if we speak about cosmic neutrinos, uh, as the previous uh, speaker said, most of the muon flux that will interfere uh, uh, is going to be the major part of your detector uh, problem, noise. Uh, now, the neutrinos that we detect underground are the so-called uh, uh, daughter neutrinos, uh, daughter muons. Mm -hmm. uh, when the, the, the neutrino uh, traverses the, the crust, uh, it creates a nuclear reaction and that uh, uh, creates a, a, a muon. And the muon, that muon is horizontal, while the muons that they are, your noise comes from, uh, 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 from basically the zenith uh, 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 angles. And that's what, why you have to go deeper and deeper and deeper. So if the interest is on cosmic neutrinos, we might have a problem with the 800 meters. We might have to go to the original experiment of cell shock when they discover the cosmic neutrino. When they discover the cosmic neutrino, which was done at 3,600 3, meters, for exactly this reason, to avoid that uh, particular noise. The other thing is that um, um, the uh, dark matter uh, now, dark matter, we don't even know what we are going to be detecting. Uh, we have a hypothetical particle that uh, will go up to one EV, uh, and most probably we will have to have a, a resolution of 0 0.001 EV. That means that uh, the, the demands on this type of detectors, in terms of, uh, of the materials that one uh, uh, needs, uh, is extremely uh, difficult. Of course, one can buy detectors and do these kind of experiments, but most of these labs, from the little that I know, is they are developing materials. And I would be very happy if we go into this kind of game. That is another spin-off to have uh, material scientists in, uh, in, uh, in South Africa working on that. BITS uh, has a huge team of material scientists. So, But uh, can you tell me th that? 800 meters, is it going to be enough? Or should we go to a mine? Uh, that's, a, that's a tricky question. Um, sure. Uh, the, yeah, the, but, uh, the, we, we, have, we have some profile, uh, Robbie, uh, that was shown by um, Aldo Yanni uh, at SSP, showing uh, the position of, uh, of Paul uh, among all the other labs. Uh, uh, there's you're, certainly you're, something. Yeah. yeah. Yes. I mean, you, so, and, and right. that was not catastrophic, actually. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> it, I mean, it, it was the, a good. Yeah. M most of the muons, well, the average muon energy is something like 3 GeV, but the 3 GeV muon gets stopped in like 20 meters of granite. Um, 
So actually, it's only the really high energy ones which we see in any case. And certainly, there are some things for which if you were deeper, you would be better off. And as you say, when you're really deep, then actually you, you're only seeing the muons which are formed by the neutrinos. And I don't think we, uh, the muons formed by, muons, yeah, yeah, yeah. Yes, you, you can wait at, the, at that type of depth. You can wait a, a suppression factor of a 10 to the 4, let's say, roughly speaking, with respect to the to, to, to the moon flux, and which is, uh, as uh, Feirouz mentioned, uh, this is uh, something that you can live with. It depends, of course, of uh, what you, you're looking for. But, uh, okay, yeah, I think... no, I mean, uh, the, the more depth, the better in some, for some things. But there are lots of things which can be done too in, a, yeah. in one which is 800 yeah, meters deep. Exactly. Uh, of course, it's 800 meters of rock, so it's more than that water equivalent, which is yes, what water equivalent is three thousands. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. So uh, Eli uh, Elias, you have I have put in the chat a link to our uh, symposium in January that was held in South Africa uh, at Duclos, uh, and. Uh, you can see there all the talks and mm -hmm. uh, all, all the, I mean, all, the, all, the, all of your question will be answered, I, I believe. <laughs> but then you are really welcome to to join because yes, we need people who who, who are, uh, I will say, that are, are more uh, engineering, material physics, and making innovation, creation, and all these things. This is what is happening in the northern part of of this uh, this earth. So people are working to 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 build the most uh, uh, the most uh, f fantastic uh, instrument to 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 get a hint of dark matter or whatever. So and then this will will increase also the skills, the expertise, and and you you know all the spin off uh, behind uh, for south africa so this is also our goal okay i think we should uh, wrap up but uh, uh, yeah it is it's just amazing how nuclear physicists have managed to measure things you know with channeling for example where uh, things which you would have thought would be impossible to measure People come up with the most amazing things. Okay, th I, I think uh, we should wrap up now. Uh, um, it's getting, uh, we, we've gone well well over time. Thanks very much, um, Jacques. I think that was an excellent introduction to the people here. And as uh, Farouz says, I should send an email with a link which you can send to the other people, which, which uh, gives all the talks that took place at the symposium, which we had in January. At the tunnel, there's this the Kloof Lodge just outside the tunnel. That'll give people a, a good indication of various things that people were speaking about, like the um, uh, biological measurements and things like that. And then the other thing, Robbie, please collect all the uh, the people willing to join us, <laughs> all the emails, so we will add them in the in this mailing list, so they know all about the project and and can can join the task forces and and all, all, all the the meeting that you are doing. Uh, yes, and please, will you send me a copy of everything you've shared in the, <laughs> the chat? So I can yeah, yeah, sure. sure. Yes, this. yes. Thank you very much. Right, thanks. Thanks very much. Bye, Robbie. See you. Thanks, guys. Thanks. Thanks.